So now we are finally done with electricity and we can move on to magnetism. Although as you'll see, uh, magnetism and electricity are very closely related to each other. So let's start with some of the basics. Um, before we talk about magnetism in particular, we need to get back to some mathematics that um, hopefully came up in your physics one class but that are very important when you start talking about magnetic fields and magnetic forces. So we're going to introduce or reintroduce a concept called the vector product or the cross product, which is a means of multiplying vectors together, unlike the dot product. So uh, when we talked about um, uh, electric potential, we uh, use the vector dot product. And when we talked about electric flux, we use the dot product. But the dot product is a scalar. Uh, the cross product is another vector rather than a scalar. So how does this look mathematically? So if C is equal to A cross B, where C is a vector and A and B are vectors that can have X, Y, and or Z components, the X component of C is equal to AYBZ minus AZBY. The Y component of C is equal to AZBX minus AXBZ. The Z component of C is equal to AXBY minus AYBX. If um, you've worked with determinants, you can write this as a three by three uh, determinant of a matrix where the first row is i hat, j hat, k hat, the second row is a x, a y, a z, and the third row is uh, b x, b y, b z. So then the cross product vector c is equal to a y, b z minus a z, b y in the i hat, i hat rather, plus AZBX minus AXBZ J hat plus AXBY minus AYBX K hat. So that's how you break it into components. So it's not necessarily, it's not as easy as the dot product, but it can be very important in a number of uh, physics applications, including uh, magnetism. So, you can also qualitatively figure out the direction uh, and uh, using what are called uh, right-hand rules. So for cross products, you wanna point uh, the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector, curl your fingers in the direction of the second vector and the thumb will point in the direction of the cross product. And so that's the basis of what are called right-hand rules. And so we'll introduce a couple of right-hand rules um, over the course of the next couple of chapters. The first right-hand rule I want to uh, mention, and I'm calling it right-hand rule number zero because it goes back to physics one when we talked about rotational motion. And um, so, you curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation and your thumb will point in the direction of the torque vector. That also works the same with angular momentum as well, that those vectors don't actually point in the direction of the rotation, they point in the direction of the axis of rotation. And which way along the axis, again, depends on the rotation. So you curl your fingers in the direction of, in the case of angular momentum, it's the angular velocity. In the case of torque, it's the angular acceleration and then your thumb will point in the direction of the torque vector. And that's something to keep in mind because we'll be talking about torque at the end of this chapter. So now we're going to talk a little bit about magnets in general. And so you probably already know some basic things about uh, magnets. Um, magnets are different. One of the ways that magnetism is different than electricity is that with electricity, you can have isolated positive or negative charges. With magnetism, it doesn't work that way. You can never have, or at least um, in uh, you know, real world physics, you can never have uh, a magnetic north pole 
and a magnetic south pole separate from each other. If you have one, then you have the other. And so magnetism is always bipolar in that sense. And um, some advanced physics theories call for the existence of magnetic monopoles. So if you have a high enough energy collision, you might be able to isolate a magnetic north without a magnetic south or vice versa. But it's never been observed, at least not yet. Um, one thing that, that's similar to electricity, uh, it, you know, one magnetic property that's similar to electricity is that like poles repel each other. So if you put two north poles near each other, they'll repel each other. If you put two south poles near each other, they will repel each other. Um, but opposite poles attract. So if you put a north pole near a south pole, they will attract each other. Like electric fields, magnetic field vectors can be depicted graphically using field lines. So you saw the experiment for electric field mapping. Magnetic field lines come out of the North Pole and enter the South Pole. So it's a little bit, it's similar in some ways to coming out of a positive charge and entering a negative charge. Um, but magnetic fields are always bipolar. You're always going to have a negative, you're always going to have a South Pole if you have a North Pole. So if you remember the electric field mapping experiment where you had the positive point charge and a negative point charge, magnetic fields always look a little bit like that, that there's a lot of circling around uh, to go back from the north to the south. But if you um, map the field lines around a bar magnet, for example, with a clearly defined north and south pole, um, the field you would get is not all that different than what you see in that um, electric field configuration with the positive and the negative point charges. Magnetism is another example of a field force. So the magnets don't have to be in contact with each other uh, in order to exert a force on each other. One important distinction between electricity and magnetism is that magnetic fields exert a force on moving electrical charges. So electric forces act on electric charges whether they are stationary or moving. Um, so the motion doesn't matter, but with magnetism, the motion absolutely matters. You can't have a magnetic force on a motionless electric charge. And what we'll see in the next chapter is that you can't have a magnetic field due to a motionless electric charge. So the last thing I want to visualize a little bit, why is magnetism generally associated with attraction? So uh, you have a magnet, it's picking up pieces of... Uh, metal, especially pieces of iron, and it's always attracted. Well, why is that? So I just want to visualize this a little bit, which means going to the whiteboard. But if you remember when we talked about induced electric charges, we talked about you could put a, a positive charge or a negative charged object uh, near a conductor, and either way you would get attraction. And um, Magnetism works in a similar way. So let's say you have a magnetic south pole and a magnetic north pole. So you have some sort of mag uh, magnet. And then you have an iron object. So we'll talk about the physics of this. We'll start to talk about the physics of this in this chapter, and we'll get into it a bit more in the next chapter. So we have an iron object, um, and an iron object has a lot of circling electrons that you know, create their own magnetic fields. And I won't get into the details of it now, but we'll talk about it more as this chapter and the next chapter go on. But what happens is when an iron object is exposed to a magnetic field, uh, the moving charges within the iron will orient themselves to create a magnetic field which lines up with whatever mag external magnetic field is influencing it. So what you get is a south pole and a north pole. So things, again, the magnetic field lines up with uh, whatever magnetic field is influencing that.
And what you wind up happening is the North Pole, in this case, since the North Pole of the external magnet is facing um, the South Pole of the iron that's now been magnetized, at least temporarily, you have attraction. And if you were to flip the bar magnet around, uh, the polarity here would also reverse so that you'd have the North Pole on the left side and the South Pole on the right side, you would still get attraction. And we'll start, again, we'll start to get into the explanation of why you have this, um, uh, you know, why the, um, you can think of iron as being a large number of magnets or, you know, tiny uh, magnets uh, that if they're not exposed to an external magnetic field, the individual magnetic fields will point in random directions and cancel each other out. But when they are exposed to a magnetic field, um, they will line up with that external magnetic field. And uh, that's why you wind up getting the attraction. So the South Pole and the temporarily magnetized iron is facing the North Pole that's near it. And like I said, if you were to flip the bar magnet, you would flip the polarity in the iron. And uh, so this is why a magnet can pick up, um, you know, can attract and pick up all sorts of objects that have some amount of iron present inside them. Not all metals exhibit this property and none of the other metals exhibit it as strongly as iron does. So let's get back to the lecture. So the most obvious magnet that we interact with on a daily basis, and you'll eventually see a lab experiment on this, is the Earth. The Earth has a magnetic field. And a compass, um, you know, we think of a compass that always points north, or at least it always points north if you're not putting it near a stronger magnet than the Earth is. And um, so it will, uh, you know, absent any other source of magnetism, it'll point in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, which is typically north, at least in the horizontal sense. The uh, Earth's magnetic field also has a vertical component. It points up out of the southern part of the Earth and points in towards the northern part of the Earth. One of the consequences of this, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, the Earth's magnetic north pole is actually located near its geographic south pole. So it's in Antarctica. The Earth's magnetic south pole is, I believe, in the upper reaches of Canada, you know, the northernmost reaches of Canada. So fairly close to the North Pole. And so the compass actually points towards the Earth's south magnetic pole, which is very close to the North geographic pole. But the sign convention was done in the opposite way of what makes intuitive sense. Uh, so again, that's something you need to keep in mind when talking about this. But the Earth's magnetic field points out of a point near its uh, south pole. And so in the southern hemisphere, the vertical component is upward. In the northern hemisphere where we are, the vertical component is downward. For most of the Earth's surface, the horizontal component is northward. Where we are, there's a slight westward component to it as well. It's not a strong westward component. But there is a westward component. So the magnitude of the Earth's magnetic field varies from 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 to 6.5 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. So the Tesla is the SI unit of magnetic field strength. It was named for Nikolai Tesla, who was a very important electrical engineer from about 100 years ago. He's the, basically the father of our electrical grid. And when we get to chapter 30, we will talk about why Tesla um, was uh, the founder of uh, our modern electrical grid and what was the important invention that he came up with that made our grid possible. But uh, again, you'll notice fairly low looking values of about 10 to the negative five Tesla. So 
uh, what that's telling you is that a one Tesla magnetic field is about 10,000, is more than 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. So a one Tesla magnetic field is a pretty strong magnet, much like a uh, one farad capacitor would be a very, very large capacitor. So it's similar to that. And again, um, these values ultimately stem from how you define the uh, current, how you define your unit of current, which we will get to at the end of chapter 28. So at the end of the next lecture, you'll be able to see that. So now we'll start to get into some of the mathematics. What is the magnetic force on a current? So let's consider a current through a wire of length L passing through a magnetic field B uh, as a vector. So the vector form is that the force is equal to the current I times the cross product of L and B, where L is a vector, its magnitude is the length of wire pointing in the direction that the current flows through the wire. And again, uh, current direction is defined as positive, to you know, positive terminal to negative terminal. And it's important to remember that. Otherwise, you'll get your direction of the force rever reversed. So F is perpendicular to both I and B. So that's an important property of a cross product. The magnitude is equal to I times L times B times the sine of theta, where theta is the angle that the magnetic field vector makes with the wire. And if... Uh, the current of the magnetic field is not uniform, then uh, the differential element of force is equal to I times the differential element of length cross B. And so you'll need to do that, evaluate that cross product first, and then do the integral. And when we get to the Bios of Art law in the next chapter, uh, you're going to see um, how integrating over cross products works. And um, so the key is to evaluate the cross product first and then do the integral. So we get to our first right-hand rule. So this is a quantitative, or rather a qualitative way of evaluating the direction of the magnetic force. So the first thing you do is you point your fingers in the direction of the current uh, you know, through the wire. You curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and then your thumb is going to point in the direction of the force acting on the wire. So let's do an example. What is the force per meter of length on a straight wire? And this is problem number one in the, um, uh, in the textbook. So this is seven, page 727. The force per meter length on a straight wire carrying a 9.40 amp current uh, when perpendicular to a uh, 0.090 Tesla uniform magnetic field. And then what if the angle between the wire and the field is 35.0? So let's set up uh, this so that we can visualize it, which means going back to the whiteboard. So, the, um, clear this. So we have a straight wire say the current is I and that the length is equal to 1.00 meters, so that the force we get is the force per meter. And the current is 9.40 amperes. And it's perpendicular to a magnetic field of uh, 0 0.90 Tesla. And we're just asked for the, um, uh, you know, we're not asked, we're not 
given specific directions. So we can just talk about the magnitude of the force as being equal to I times L times B times the sine of theta. So the magnetic field is perpendicular to the wire. So theta is equal to 90 degrees. And uh, so the sine of theta is going to equal one. So that'll make the math fairly simple. So that becomes 9.40 amps. And again, the force, we're interested in the force per meter. So we'll treat the length as being one meter. And B is equal to 0 0.90 Tesla. And then you have uh, the sine of 90 degrees, which is just going to be one. So we plug those numbers in. And you get to two significant figures, 8.5 Tesla. So if your length is in, if you keep everything in SI units, so your current is in amperes, your length is in meters, and your magnetic field is in Tesla, your force is going to be in newtons. Uh, and so, I wrote this wrong. Uh, that's 8.5 newtons. Now the second part asks, what if the angle between the wire and the field is 35 degrees? So let's erase this part and let's draw the wire a little bit differently. So you have your current like this. And so this is theta. And because um, the field is horizontal. And so this is theta. So instead of being 90 degrees, it's 35 degrees. And so the only thing that changes is the sine of the angle. So basically we can take the answer that we had and multiply it by the sine of 35 degrees and that gives us the new value which is 4.9 newtons. So that's the answer to part B. And uh, one thing you'll notice that since it depends on the sine of theta as if I is parallel to B, there is no magnetic force. So the magnetic field and the current have to be, uh, you know, at least some component of the magnetic field has to be perpendicular to the current in order to exert any force on the wire. Um, and then, you know, that's very important. If they're parallel, there's no force at all, or the force equals zero. So getting back to the whiteboard, or rather getting back to our lecture slides. Another example, calculate the mag magnitude of the magnetic force on a 240 meter length of wire stretched between two towers and carrying 150 amps of current. And so the Earth's magnetic field um, is 5.0 times 10 to the negative five Tesla. It makes an angle of 68 degrees with the wire. So again, step one is to visualize this. So let's get back, right back to the whiteboard, clear what we have. So we have two towers. So we'll draw the ground. And there is a wire. And The length of the wire is 240 meters. And it's stretched between two towers and carrying 150 amps of current. And so the magnetic field of the Earth makes an angle of 68 degrees with the wire. And so that's 0.5.
So it's north and downward, uh, basically, uh, the Earth's magnetic field. And so B, or at least the magnitude of it, is equal to 5.0 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. And so we're asked to figure out the magnitude of the magnetic force. So again, that's equal to I times L times B times the sine of theta. So that's equal to 150 amps. So that's a really strong current um, times 240 meters times the Earth's magnetic field, 5.0 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla multiplied by the sine of 68 degrees. So you plug all those numbers in. And you get to two significant figures, 1.7 Newtons. So you might notice that force acting on the wire. Um, it's not a large force given that, uh, given the large length and the large current, um, but um, it is possible in laboratory circumstances to measure the magnetic force acting on a wire in, in, uh, in ways that you know, are observable. And again, ultimately the definition of the current or the unit of current depends on those measurements. So that's about a current moving in a wire. You can, st you can have isolated electrical charges, both positive and negative, that um, it can move in the presence of a magnetic field. Certainly a lot of uh, contemporary physics involves around moving isolated charged objects in the presence of a magnetic field and observing what happens. So it's a fairly important um, application uh, at least for, for physicists. But the vector form is F, uh, the vector F is equal to Q times vector small v, which is the um, velocity, cross B. So you're taking the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field vectors, and then multiplying that by the charge Q. So the magnitude Notice the absolute value sign for the magnitude. So the magnitude of the force, it doesn't matter what sign the charge is. The direction of the force does depend on the sign of the charge. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of seconds. So the magnitude of the force is the magnitude of Q times the magnitude of B, V times the magnitude of B times the sine of theta, where theta is the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. Qualitatively, you can figure out directions from a variant of the right-hand rule that we just talked about. So you point your fingers in the direction of the velocity, you curl them in the direction of the magnetic field, your thumb will point in the direction of F. That works for positive charges. For negative charges, um, your thumb, if you're using the right-hand rule, your thumb points in the opposite direction of the magnetic force. If you would rather use your left hand, uh, then you know your thumb points in the direction of V, you curl in the direction of, or your fingers point in the direction of V and then curl in the direction of B, your left thumb would point in the direction of the force. So that's uh, an important distinction. And whichever way you're more comfortable working with, you go with. So now let's get back to another example. Determine the magnitude and direction of the force in the electron traveling 8.75 times 10 to the five meters per second horizontally to the east in a vertically upward magnetic field of strength um, 0.45 Tesla. So, back to the whiteboard.
So, um, so we have the electron. traveling to the east, so that's in the x direction. And so, um, and the magnetic field is pointing upward. So that's east. This is uh, the magnetic field is pointing upwards. So if you think of uh, uh, the compass directions, north is into board and south is out of board. And so we are given that the velocity is equal to, um, what was it, 8.75? 8.75 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. And it's in the east direction. So we'll define our x, y, and z coordinates geographically. So the positive x direction is east. And the magnetic field is, um, that number is 0 0.45 Tesla. And that's in the k hat direction where we're defining up as the uh, z direction and then north as the positive y direction. So there are a couple of ways you can think about this. So from the right hand rule, you point your fingers in the direction of V, you curl them in the direction of V, or B rather. Your thumb points out of the board, but it's a negative charge. So uh, the, force, uh, the force points in the opposite direction of the thumb, which is into the board. So which we've defined as north. And so the force is equal to QVB times the sine of theta, but again, east is perpendicular, east is a horizontal, you know, east is horizontal and vertical is, or up is vertical. They're perpendicular to each other. So uh, the sine of uh, theta, or theta is 90 degrees, and the sine of 90 is one. So we can write that as 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times 8.75, and this is just the magnitude of the velocity, times 10 to the five meters per second, and then 0 0.45 Tesla. And so you plug those values in, and that's 1.6, times 8.75E5 times 0.45. And that gives 6.3 times 10 to the negative 14 Newtons. Now that might not seem like a really big force, but think about the mass of the electron, which is on the order of 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So you're looking at an acceleration on the order of 10 to the 17 meters per second squared. So that'll pr produce a really strong acceleration. Okay, so with that, let's move on. Find the direction of the force on a negative, and so this is number 16, on a negative charge for each diagram shown in figure uh, 2742, where V is the velocity of the charge, 
and B is the direction of the magnetic field. So we're definitely going to need the whiteboard for this. So we're going to be applying the right hand rule here. So uh, the dot means it points outward towards me. And the X, when we see the X means it points inward. So, and these are negative charges. So the dot means it points out. So you point your fingers out, you curl your fingers down. My thumb is pointing to the right, but it's a negative charge. So the force is to the left. And so now we're gonna to move to part B. So the magnetic field is pointing in. So X means inward. And V is now pointing down. So you point your fingers downward. You wanna curl your fingers in the direction of B. And so your thumb again points to the right but it's a negative charge, so the force again points left. Now we move on to number C. The velocity is pointing inward, and you can look on at the bottom right corner of page 727. B points to the right, so fingers point in, curl to the right, your thumb is pointing downward, which means since it's a negative charge, the force is upward. Then uh, for D, B is up and the velocity is to the right. So you point your fingers to the right, you curl them up, your thumb is pointing out, which means the force is pointing in. The force points in. For E, and E is a bit of a trick question, V points to the left, but B points to the right. So they act in completely opposite directions to each other. So the sine of theta, if they're in opposite directions, theta is 180 degrees, but the sine of 180 degrees is zero. Um, so if they're in pointing in completely opposite directions, it's the same if they were pointing in the same direction, the magnetic force would be zero. So there's no direction and no magnitude because there's no force at all. And then for the last one, B points out and V points to the left. So V points to the left, curls um, outward. So V points to the left and curls outwards. Your thumb points up, that means the force points down. And so that's how it works. And you know, that's how the right hand rule applies. And if you have any questions uh, about that, uh, let me know via email and hopefully I'll be able to clarify things for you. So now moving on with the lecture. We're not going to get to what's called the cyclotron equation. What you've noticed is that um, the force is always perpendicular to both the velocity and to the magnetic field. In physics one, we already talked about an example. Um, we already talked about some cases 
where the force is perpendicular to the object's motion. And that was with centripetal forces, that they're always perpendicular to the object's motion, and that make, makes the object move in a circular trajectory. Well, that's what happens when objects move in a magnetic field. The force, when charged objects move in a magnetic field, they experience a force that's always gonna be perpendicular to their motion, and so they move in a circle. So um, consider an object of charge Q and velocity V entering a uniform magnetic field of strength B and direction perpendicular to V. And so the path will be um, circular. If the velocity initially was per uh, not perpendicular to B, it would work in a, move in a spiral motion so that um, you know, it would be circular in a plane, but there would be a component perpendicular to that uh, uh, plane as well. Um, but if it starts out uh, where V and B are perpendicular, they're going to remain perpendicular and the object is going to move in a circle. And so the magnetic force is the centripetal force. So QVB is equal to MV squared over R. And again, if V and B are uh, perpendicular to each other to begin with, you don't need to worry about the sine of theta. And so what's called the cyclotron equation is that R is equal to MV over QB. And uh, so you can design cyclotrons of different sizes depending on you know, what it is that you want to do. The original cyclotrons were actually pretty small. You could hold them in your hands. Um, but the big particle accelerators like the one at Brookhaven Lab, R can be, uh, you know, several miles. Um, you know, and it depends on what exactly it is that you're trying to do. Now, the cyclotron frequency, so omega in terms of radians per second, and, you know, some of you may have had angular motion or not, but uh, if you remember circular motion in physics one, that uh, the angular velocity is equal to V divided by R. So that's essentially what the cyclotron frequency is. Uh, you know, the amount of times per second that uh, the charged object makes a complete circle. And so that's equal to V over R. And so when you do the math, that's equal to QB over M. And that value is in radians per second, uh, not uh, complete cycles per second. Remember, um, omega is also equal to 2 pi f, where f is the frequency in complete cycles per second. But omega is in radians per second. So let's make an example out of that. So this is number 14. So an electron is projected vertically upward with a speed of 1.70 times 10 to the 6 meters per second into a uniform magnetic field that is directed horizontally away from the observer. So you have an electron like that, and B is directed away from the observer. So B points into the board. Describe the electron's path in this field. Okay, so initially, the electron is moving up, and B points into the board. So you point your fingers up, curl them into the board. Um, the thumb points left, but remember it's uh, an, an electron which is negatively charged, so the force is to the right. So what happens is, and I'll erase some of this. So it's initially pointing upward, but F points to the right, and so it'll start to curl. And when it gets up here, uh, so that it's moving to the right, so you point your fingers to the right and curl them into the board. Thumb points up, it's a negative charge, the force is downward. 
So it circles downward, and you can see how this is going at this point. Uh, here the force will be to the left. And so it gets to the bottom. And here F is upward. And you can check the right hand rules for yourself, and then it goes back uh, to its initial position. So it moves in a circle like that. And the radius involved is MV over Q. And you can write the absolute value here. You want the magnitude of the charge. So we, uh, you can, we can see that it's a clockwise circle. And so you plug in the numbers. The mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. The velocity is 1.70 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. The charge of an electron is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And B is 0 0.480 Tesla. So you plug those numbers in, you get uh, 2.02 times 10 to the negative five meters. So not big by our standards, Big by atomic standards, but you know, not big by our standards. This is not uh, you know, how you would design the, the, the rick at Brookhaven, for example. Uh, but, uh, so it's not big by our standards. But um, again, by atomic standards, that's a fairly big circle that it's sweeping around. So uh, alpha particles of charge, this is problem number 15, of charge Q is equal to plus 2E and mass 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 7 kilograms. So alpha particles are emitted radioactively. They consist of two protons and two neutrons. So the protons are what give it the plus 2E charge. And um, uh, protons and neutrons have had fairly similar masses to each other. They're emitted from a radioactive source at a speed of 1.6 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. What magnetic field strength would be required to bend them into a circular path of radius r is equal to 0.18 meters? So let's, again, apply the cyclotron equation so that r is equal to mv over qb. And so um, we're given the radius, we're given the velocity. You want to solve this for B. So B is equal to MV over QR. And this is something, now it's an alpha particle. So it's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So it's quite a bit more massive than an electron. The velocity is 1.6 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Q is 2E, so that's 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And R, the radius we have, is 0 0.18 meters, 18 centimeters. So you plug all those numbers in. And you get a 1.8 Tesla magnetic field. So that's a pretty strong magnetic field.